So, all right. So here's the thing. Game theory is a very broad topic. It can be very dense. I'm going to try to do something in 20 minutes. So, and I talk relatively fast. So I'm going to try to slow down and get a lot of information in. Let's see how, which one of those sides work. So, um, so really quick, my name is Ryan Rutan. Um, I'm with Senac. I am the senior director of community there, which means I get the privilege of running the Senac Red team. Um, we use gamification constantly on our platform, and this is something that I do quite a bit. Um, some background for me, uh, the Red Team director for the last three years, uh, community developer relations and enterprise game, games for the last 13 years. Uh, I was a developer, API specialist, integration architect, and for the last 20 years, hacker, maker, and author. So I live and breathe technology. I love talking about technology. I see a lot of familiar faces here I've met today. Um, hopefully, uh, we'll have something interesting for you guys to learn. Really quick, talking about game theory, like I said, it's very dense. Um, you can have a lot of academics that go really deep on it. The one definition that I really like about it, I think it's really easy to kind of grok, is the study of mathematical models for negotiation, conflict, and cooperation. The way I like to visualize this is that game theory is about taking these different graphs, putting them on a grid, and looking at where they intersect. And where those intersection points are, game theory is about moving those in the way where you want them to live, where negotiation, cooperation, and conflict and moving those intersection points appropriately. For gamification, on my end, the thing that I find that's very valuable for hackers is I actually see gamification as almost like an information disclosure. It's the house tipping their hand saying, hey, this is what's valuable to me. I'm giving you money. I'm giving you points. I'm giving you prizes. It's telling you what they want you to do, and it's up to you to determine is it what you want to do. And so for me, this is really cool because if you look at modern games, no one ever goes like, uh, back in my day, I, yes, I said that, I'm you know, kind of old, but end of the day, you used to have a book, how to read a game, how to do something, right? You read the book and that's how you did it. Today, it's in-app tutorials. It's a game that shows you, oh, congratulations, you did that. Here's some stuff. Keep doing it, right? Those principles are a TLDR of how to use the system, how to use something. So gamification can actually be a really good insight into the background mindset of the people who are running these applications. So I would honestly say don't, dis don't discard it as something kind of trivial. In the about 2010s, I think the industry lost its mind and said, hey, we're going to put badges in everything. Collect badges. Oh, my God. Everything has a badge. And it was ridiculous. Badges are good. They are a tactic. They are not gamification by themselves. The reason why I say that is because the number one thing you need to do when you do gamification is to know your audience. Um, a lot of people said, I'm going to be a, I'm going to go and grab gamification off the shelf, drop it in, and everything's good. Badges work for some people. They don't work for all people. Um, in terms of knowing your audience, I put some motivators down here I wanted to kind of throw out real fast. I'm focusing on the red side right now since that's kind of what I do on a day job. Um, financial, you would think that it's the best motivator out there, right? I mean, who doesn't like money? But from a gamification perspective, you need to make sure that this your goal is to make a game that scales. And money is actually one of the most volatile um, markets or the volatile and motivators that you can have. Specifically, because when you do money, one, when you're doing gamification, you have to get money to create these programs, and that's really hard to justify. So it's, it's actually like a one-to-one -one thing. You want to find a more diluted motivator. The other reason why it's difficult is because as a player, I expect that if I start off at a dollar and I become really good on your platform, I expect $2 for that expertise. As a business, if I put a dollar at the beginning, what do I expect in terms of economies of scale? I expect that dollar to go to 50 cents. And as those lot lines diverge, that's where gamification comes in. You have to find other motivators that work with the community and with the players to make up that difference so that those lines are more congruent for longer to make it so people stay sustained in the game. Other things that I have down here at the bottom are all things that are kind of emotional, but they're things that I feel are very innate to the hacker culture. And so I wanted to point those out reputation and recognition like people want to be acknowledged for good work that they do don't undercut that joy and passion i mean we've i hope i'm in a room of fellow people where when you see like a binary string you're like what the heck does that say i want to decrypt it i want to know what's going on i really enjoy technology um curiosity education like accepting the challenge knowing that you want to do something more that's something you can use to motivate somebody giving them an opportunity opportunity to learn something that they haven't done before sense of duty also is a great one. My one at the, at the bottom was something I really like is unique is around the concept of going from a number to a name, like becoming personal and understanding that the game understands me and that it can help elevate my status. But what's cool about all this is that, so this is all the red team stuff. Um, it's the same for the blue team. 
the gamification applies to the, pers the person, not necessarily the domain. So all these different motivators that you have are also, also work for the blue side as well. And it's important because when we start talking about uh, downstream or talk about the practical like sock gamification is the ability to you to create cross pollinated games where you can have blue and red and purple and having all these games intermingle and ultimately creating a stronger uh, uh, security posture for your company. Now, the things I will say in terms of the best practice I tip I can give you for this is you do not want to go all in on one type of motivator. You want to diversify. Like I said, your goal is to try to make those congruent line, make those lines more congruent and you can't overload something. If you look at sense of duty, right? You might be able to tap that once, tap it twice, tap it three times and they're happy. But then after a fourth time, they get burned out. Like they, you know, there's only so much you can do. You need to, to kind of diversify things up a bit. Um, so tap into the education or tap into the money, tap into the passion, like find different ways that you can motivate people to kind of get them to do the thing that you need them to do. Um, and since we're near GCHQ, if you don't want to remember my framework, mice, for those who are in the audience that know what it is, uh, money, ideology, compromise, ego, that's basically what I'm talking about. <laughs> so, so some of the things that we do for the Synac red team, I want to try to do this really quick only because I want you to help understand the things that, that we have. In our red team, we have three main personas that we do for games. We have the hunter, which is the, the bug bounty hunter, the person that wants to kind of do active engagement and vuln hunting. Specialist, which is a person that has a very specific set of skills that may or may not be used on a, on a regular basis, but the ability to tap into them when needed. And then the most, most recent one we have is mentor, which I've talked to a lot of you about today. Um, all three of those personas live in our community and they all play in the game and they have a mechanism for being recognized and rewarded and creating their own paths to success. Um, the main thing that we do, which is I would consider it garden kind of basic that you need to do is have an element of a point system. Anyone been to a VR, video arcade where you put a dollar in and you get a certain number of tokens back that have no monetary value only in, except in that arcade. That is basically what you're doing. You're trying to decouple their actions and put it into a term that's really easy to say, like, oh, I need points. I don't want to think about what I need to do to get those points, but I just need to create that economy, which is really important. Having leaderboards, having things like uh, reputation levels, like, you know, where are you trending? How have you been over the last 12 months? Those are all things that keep the keep you active and engaged. Like, oh, I don't want to lose my level. Oh, I want to know where I am. Am I better? Am I worse? Do I need to you know, step it up or can I kind of pump the brakes? Those are kind of garden variety things. The thing that I think that we do that's really fun is around uh, our recognition programs. And what's important about them is that it allows people to have clear paths to success. I just got a thousand points. Is that good? I don't know. Like it's like, it's, but if we go out and say, Hey, you know what? 10,000 points a year. That's really great. That's a way that you can kind of become recognized, become a top researcher with us and kind of earn some accolades and earn recognition that helps them understand, well, okay, a thousand points. That's, that's, I'm on the way, but I'm not quite there yet. It means I should need to go a little bit further. The other piece of that is that we actually use nested programs. Um, so there's the thing called sunk, uh, sunk cost fallacy, which is actually the notion is like, I've already invested this much time. What's just a little bit more. Um, it pairs well with the notion that people have a hard time setting long-term goals. Um, we have in our nested programs, we have monthly, annual, and lifetime. So lifetime goals are things that we set very thematic goals. So our goals in the re uh, Synac researcher, uh, Synac red team is to try to address the talent gap. We want our researchers working on as many organizations as possible so that we can hopefully get that talent to affect as many companies as possible and try to close that gap to the best that we can. So we set that as a big thematic goal in our lifetime achievement, working on 250 targets, working across 100 organizations, 1,500 volts lifetime. Like things are really hard to grok when you're getting started. But if you work back and say, oh, on an annual basis, right, we'll give you a hacker throne or a customized hoodie or stuff like that. And all you have to do is earn 15,000 points, right? They can see those goals and it's an, an annual way. And the annual is kind of a build up to the lifetime. And then we have a monthly one. The monthly one is like, well, how much is 10,000 points? Can I do it? I'm not sure if I can. Here's a monthly competition that gives you a sample size of like, hey, I earned 700 points this month. 700 times 12? Oh, that's 80. Uh, yeah, it's 8,400. So I was like, I had to double check that real quick. Uh, but again, so it helps them understand like, well, if I want to hit that goal, I got to step it up a little bit. Or if I'm over it, I can back it off. And it helps set the expectation so that they get a sense to play the game on a, on a more regular basis. One of the things that I've talked a lot about today is the notion of in our community, we've been 
pivoting over the last two to three years around getting away from competitive and going to more cooperative in the sense that seeing a lot of embracing in the community around researchers helping each other become better, solving, you know, kind of making it so that we can all have better skills. And so our community is starting to pivot a lot of our game and game theory applications around getting researchers to do team-based objectives and achieve those goals. And as a result of that, having them decide where the prizes go and how that works. So it's really a great way to build camaraderie. And ultimately, the motivators that we have um, are all the ones I listed before, like all these programs list. So whether you've heard me talk about our women's group and the Artemis uh, community, whether it's about our veteran community, our mentors, our annual recognition, all of those, there's pathways in our recognition program and our game to make it so that they can be their persona and find success and ultimately be recognized. So the biggest question is, how do you get started? Sustainability, like the goal of a game, of the solid game, is to invest money into the, in, in, invest money into the initiative and then have it sustain and be your 24-7, 365, you know, extra hand in, the, in whatever you're trying to do. First thing I have to tell, and this is that you'll hear from every business person, is you need to focus on measurable objectives. Um, when it comes to gamification, you always have to pitch. You always have to get money. As a result of that, you need to be able to measure and create a business value proposition to whoever holds the purse strings. Um, so when you, talks about, when you talk about doing things with the gamification, you need to figure out what are the actual outcomes in my business or in whatever I'm doing that I can impact and make sure that you can measure it. And that way you can ultimately start doing, uh, start doing some analysis. Now you need to measure it both from the game side, meaning for the company or for the host, but you also need to do it from the player side. The most important part of the game theory is that mutual success. You need to make sure that you can invest money on the left and make sure that you can in, uh, change the outcome on the right and make sure that you can prove that model. Um, I always talk about planning macro, but executing micro. So understand the thematic direction that you want to go and taking a small chunk and executing it. Uh, with that, I also say budget for the experiment and then a program. So take an experiment in terms of like ask for $1,000 or ask for $500 or um, ask for a free pass to something and put, uh, put that as a reward or put an opportunity as a reward and try to test out the theory of like what motivates your community, what motivates your, the players in your game. And as you learn more, as you test those things out, you'll be able to prove, hey, this type of motivator works. This type of uh, functionality works really well. And as a result of that, you can then take that experiment and codify it into an actual program uh, with a bigger budget and with justification that shows, hey, I know that our community did this. We can start experimenting and growing that. Um, last thing, uh, last couple things I'll say on this is setting expectations is really important. So uh, when you are dealing with early participants, letting them know that one, hey, this is an experiment. It may go completely horrible. It may go be insanely great, but taking and getting cooperative information from them, getting their feedback and making sure that your motivators are properly assessed. And then it's just rinse and repeat at that point. You just take new chunks of that thematic goal and you kind of create new experiments, grow your program, and you take it and kind of roll it out in stages. So what does this look like? Um, so from a red side, you know, so what I, I want to urge you to think about is that when we talk about the motivators and why they're the same for every um, cybersecurity person, what I'm going to focus on right now is just the red side. So if you wanted to build up a game for a SOC and try to make it so that it was easier or more fun for people to be in the SOC, right, or to be related to keeping your company safe, on the red side, you can look at players that are potentially in the SOC or even things like in product, QA, anyone who has a contributing role in making a better security posture for your company. So this role can extend outside of the SOC and creating uh, better PRDs that include secure features, better sec dev, better you know, overall QA. These are all things that can improve your overall SOC and you can gamify and create a, uh, create a mechanism that allows to... Uh, to reinforce good behavior. Um, the type of tasks that you have, standard red team task, you've got pen testing, recon, training, you, you name it. These are all things that help improve the posture of the company. The benefits of this, of doing gamification in this realm, is that one is orchestration. Everyone's seen like Hive Mind, if Stranger Things, hopefully, yes, great show. But the notion is <laughs> that um, being able to control, put this game out there and the game is helping control the actions of a bunch of people. Putting a game with reward and incentive kind of gets people to flock to that direction to do this type of work and ultimately gets you get an element of unified growth or unified action for people all trying to go for the same goal. Recognition is really important when it comes to retention today, finding security talent and keeping them, getting a signal that says, hey, these are the people that have an objective 
re, uh, objective impact on business value for the company and getting a game out there that gets them a, a rank and gets them a leaderboard to stick up and kind of be recognized is a great way to kind of retain the talent that is really affecting the bottom line. Speed and quality are a natural derivative of this because most of the time games are about, I want to do something faster. I want to increase the quality of this. I want to do something more reliable. Um, and lastly, the one I'm really big on right now, and I've been for a long time, is camaraderie. Hacking is a very siloed industry. A lot of people have found that they are alone. They don't feel like the need they can connect with people. So increasing those connections with other researchers, other people in the profession, and creating teams that are really that really work well together. So this is a byproduct of that. Now, the way I would look at this is that you've also got the blue side of this. You have a game that you can run for the red side. So you have like the red MVP, if you will, the red, uh, the red person of the month, if you want. You can create well, all these types of recognitions and goals and achievements to get that. But then you've got the blue side and all the tasks that they do. Those can actually run independent as well. And so again, you want to make sure that there's an opportunity the same way we have specific recognitions for mentors or for hunters or for specialists. These are specific games that kind of coexist, but they're for different audiences. Nothing says a red person can't go and participate in the blue side or vice versa, but there's a clear path that says, hey, if you want to be recognized for the things that the blue side does and the things we want to motivate people to do, there's a structure there for that. Um, and again, the same well element here is that you have all the different organizations that you can tap into, which is great. The evolution, though, of purple makes a, a really interesting problem or an interesting opportunity because the problem historically has been, how do I measure impact? Purple teams tend to have the tools that are needed to really aggregate the data and bring stuff in. So if you've got the benefit of a purple team that can digest all the information from systems like Jira, uh, White Hat, or whatever um, that you're using to get that information, you can use that as a way to kind of create a master game that says, look, here's a game that spans the entire company and ultimately creates an opportunity to say, these are the people that are having the most impact on keeping this company secure. And so for me, this is an area where you can do, you know, red, blue, red versus blue, you could have purple. But again, the, the reality here is if you can measure impact, you do the work to understand what the outcomes are at the end that add value to your business and make it more secure, then you can make it more fun for people to do the things that they're doing and potentially incentivize them to move faster. So my takeaways, um, focus on measurable business outcomes, important. If you're not doing that, you're, you're going to have a hard time making a game that scales. Um, point economy and leaderboards, um, formal or informal, um, you don't have to have a system to do it. I've seen really effective games done with Google spreadsheets and some really cool charts and you know, whatnot. So it just needs to be a way for people to understand how do I know where I am? Am I behind? Am I ahead? Where am I in relation to everything? Um, and these things are really important for scale because at the end of the day, if you need to, these things need to be updated relatively uh, accurately and ultimately uh, just responsive. Um, communicate, communicate clear paths to success. Again, this is important understanding like I made a bunch of points or I've made a bunch of progress, but how long, how far along that path am I? What is, how successful am I? And how, what are the expectations to be successful? Um, nested programs, I can't recommend them enough. They are a great way to kind of get the ball rolling and kind of keep people rolling. Um, I've had researchers come in and tell me gamification, it's, it's silly, it's stupid. I'm never going to do it. Four months later, they come back and say, oh my gosh, this stuff works. I can't believe how much I care about levels or the fact that I want to get these challenge coins or I want my customized hoodie or my hacker throne or whatever, right? They see the prizes and they want it or they want the recognition. Like uh, our Synac Acropolis is like a website that's basically building their personal brand. So we help build the individual researcher's personal brand with this website. And to get on it, you have to earn 10,000 points. Well, get on 10,000 points, you've got to go and help a certain number of customers. And then, you know, it all works itself back to a very interesting opportunity where they can have a clear path of if I want to build my personal brand, I know know what I need to do to go give, go do that. Um, last two things I'll say really quick. Uh, most effective games are actually ones that are already being played. So setting up an easy game. So for example, like I need to have an incident response and an uh, incident response game that's like you need to close 10 incident responses in a month and that's that earns you some kind of badge. Most people don't like gamification out of the right, but when they realize that doing their normal day job will get them some extra money or get them some recognition and they realize, oh, I'm almost there. If I just did a little bit more, I could actually get this little pride. Like it's those recognitions, like I'm pretty much there. That's the piece that gets them over the hump. And then they kind of start getting into the game. Um, and the last thing I'll just say is that, you know, understanding what motivates your audience is pretty interesting. But if you don't know, just ask, like you don't want to guess 
ask, have conferences, have calls with them, take notes, look for themes, and try things out. At the end of the day, you don't have to be an expert. As long as what you're doing is a reflection of the players in the game, they're going to enjoy and have a good time. So I don't know what the time is, but I actually did it pretty fast. Uh, but if you ever have any questions, oh, look at that. Pretty good. Uh, if you ever have questions, Twitter, you can reach out to me at Ryan Rutan. LinkedIn is actually my preferred way. Twitter is like really, really crazy for me because of the DMs. But I'm also, uh, we're giving away some swag at our table at the end. And I also have cards and I just like to talk. So just come say hi. Thank you. Any questions? All right. Yes, sir. So the game, so our experiments are time bounded. Our games are perpetual. And so, and again, our games are set up as programs that run annually, lifetime, and monthly. And they're set up. The reason why we do that is changing the game and changing the rules. It creates whiplash. Like what ideally is what you want is you want people doing the same thing. So for us, the points system is our abstraction. Like we have things that people can do on platform, off platform, whatever to earn points. And we frame everything that we do in terms of rewards and structures and progress in terms of points. So if we want to do something side for a temporary purpose, like an experiment, we'll say, Hey, okay, we're going to do this off platform thing. We're going to do, do this experiment and we're going to award these number of points. And that's a way that we kind of can make it so that their efforts serve their, their greater good. If it would. So experiments are time bound, but all of our games are perpetual and or recurring. Our recognition, for example, is every year. So it's a rolling clock, 12 months. Our lifetime is lifetime, month is month. So, all right. Anyway. Yes, sir. Uh, what, so maturity of the company and maturity of the players. So, so my personal, so, and th I'm going to give a, a, maybe a, a thing. The, the more rigid the company is historic, like if the company has a stigma of being rigid, it's harder to feel authentic with your game. So, yeah, so again, it's not about like, Hey, we're going to throw a bunch of money at this and make this great. It just doesn't come off right. It's better to start to really to start small and grow it organically. So, um, that's the one thing you don't want the, I don't want to use imposter syndrome because that's not what I'm talking. There's a different connotation to that, but really it's like, you want to make sure that it feels like it's a part of the culture. Like if your company has created a culture that's fun, engaging and, and whatnot, then you have a much better chance of rolling out these games and, and much exp exponential scale. Um, in terms of like the, uh, the more kind of rigid companies, money works really, really well. But again, but the idea is that for me, it's about, um, I, for hackers, I like gear. Like I never give out swag that's not functional. It has to be functional. Like even if it's just cracking open a case of something, like it has to have a tool in it or something. So finding out what kind of gear, uh, what kind of tools and gears they like, that's usually what I start off with and then kind of work from there. So make it functional first and then you can kind of get into the luxury stuff. That's like, you know, I consider very, like people ask me like put keyboards, everything like to me, like I never give keyboards. That's way too intimate of a thing for like, I'm, you know, I will never give someone a keyboard because I am such a nitpicky person when it comes to my keyboard. I will, I have four of the same one just in case my one breaks, you know, it's like, that's the way I am. So does that help answer miss? Okay. All right. Well, thank you again for coming today, and I'm glad to uh, be here in the uh, UK. So thanks.